Explicit content is found in this episode, so listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to True Crime Cases. I'm your host, Lainey. Rarely do I encounter cases where the veracity of facts is so hotly contested that I find myself wavering in my stance. Typically, my research journey leads me through a maze of articles, books, and newspaper reports where minor discrepancies may arise regarding details, yet a cohesive narrative of agreed-upon facts generally emerges. Even in instances predating the Internet age, where access to breaking news was not instantaneous, The most notable disparities often revolve around trivial matters, such as name spellings, ages, and birthplaces. While occasionally irksome, these discrepancies are easily rectified through cross-referencing with other available sources, ultimately having minimal impact on the overall understanding of the case. Today, my focus turns to the contentious case of John Bodkin Adams, a figure whose portrayal varies dramatically depending on the source. Some depict him as the UK's inaugural serial-killing doctor, while others paint a picture of a compassionate caregiver dedicated to ensuring his patients' end-of-life comfort. In contrast to Adams, whose case remains shrouded in ambiguity and debate, there are other healthcare providers whose actions have been more definitively documented. For instance, Harold Shipman, a British general practitioner, was convicted of murdering 15 patients and is suspected of many more deaths. Unlike Adams, Shipman's case involved a significant body of evidence and a clear pattern of behavior, leading to his conviction. Similarly, Charles Cullen, an American nurse, pleaded guilty to murdering 22 patients and later claimed responsibility for even more deaths across multiple states. His admission and corroborating evidence painted a clearer picture of his crimes compared to the ambiguous circumstances surrounding Adams. While the cases of Shipman and Cullen provide a more concrete understanding of their crimes, there are others like Kristen Gilbert, Daniela Pagiali, and Niles Hogel, whose actions were also thoroughly investigated and resulted in convictions. These cases highlight the rarity of healthcare providers who abuse their positions of trust to harm patients. Yet, they also underscore the importance of thorough investigations and adherence to due process in uncovering the truth behind such atrocities. Okay, on to the show. John Bodkin Adams was born on January 20, 1899, in Randallstown, a small town located in Northern Ireland's county Antrim. His father, Samuel Adams, was a watchmaker who later became a justice of the peace, or court magistrate, for the town of Coleraine. John's mother was named Ellen, who BBC News described as the holiest woman in Ireland. The couple had named their son after her brother, John Bodkin, who was considered a successful missionary for the Plymouth Brethren in China. The whole family, which later included a younger brother, William, was part of the Plymouth Brethren, a subset of Protestantism that began in Dublin in the late 1820s. According to the Plymouth Herald, the Brethren followed a conservative, nonconformist, evangelical form of Christianity. The Brethren are often described as strict. Today, The most devout brethren do not own televisions or pets, do not use social media, cannot go to university, and until 2005, weren't allowed to use mobile phones or computers. Church is attended daily, men are expected to work while the women stay at home, and the women are also expected to wear some form of hair covering at all times. During prayer, they must fully cover their heads with headscarves, but often lessen coverage to a ribbon or headband while outside of the church. That was the kind of atmosphere Adams was raised in, one of strict religious adherence and restricted behaviors. Despite this, however, he was permitted to attend university, seemingly against their religious beliefs. First, during the years of 1912 to 1916, he went to a boarding school in Coleraine, during which time his father passed away from a stroke. Perhaps the death of his father impacted him in more ways than most. It might have been what pushed Adams to study medicine, 
and it might have relaxed the reins on his life enough to allow him to go to university to do so. So, in 1916, two years after his father's death, Adams was enrolled in Queen's University in Belfast, with the hopes of one day becoming a doctor. Tragedy struck again in Adams' first year of study when his brother William, who was only a teenager, contracted the Spanish flu and died. Adams himself fell ill, perhaps from a combination of grief and stress, and it delayed his studies for a year. He barely managed to scrape a degree, graduating a year after those he started alongside, but he still qualified to become a doctor. Even though Adams' grades were unremarkable, his religious background provided him with a connection that immediately found him a job upon graduation. In his last year of university, he attended a Brethren Missionary Conference, where he was introduced to lecturer and surgeon Arthur Rendell Short, who was impressed on finding out that Adams' uncle was the renowned missionary John Bodkins. Short offered Adams a job in Bristol when he graduated, and Adams eagerly accepted. Short quickly regretted this offer when he realized Adams was, let's say, inept and prompted him to apply for a different job after barely half a year in his employ. He directed Adams to a Christian magazine featuring an ad seeking a religious doctor to join a team in Eastbourne, Sussex, and Adams leapt at this chance. His application was successful, and he quickly transferred over to the new location in 1922, paying £2,000 for the privilege and bringing his mother and a cousin to live with him. Eastbourne is a seaside town along the southern coast of England, apparently given the grim nickname of God's Waiting Room because of the large proportion of elderly citizens who decide to retire there. It made sense that this was a popular destination. Eastbourne is far enough away from London to have the health benefits of the countryside, while also being close enough to regularly visit the capital city on a whim. It was also a fairly lucrative area for a doctor to work in the years before the NHS was established, when doctors' incomes could be unstable. But an elderly population tends to have a higher rate of illness and injury needing to be treated, and a wealthy population meant that there were many potential patients who could afford to pay for the doctor to make personal visits to their home. As we know from his struggles in university, Adams wasn't the most talented or well-learned doctor, but what he lacked in intellect he made up for in eagerness and hard work. Adams made himself readily available to make house calls, happy to jump on his bike at any time of the day or even night, at only a moment's notice. This made him a successful and highly requested member of the medical community in Eastbourne, garnering him enough of a clientele that he was able to upgrade his mode of transport to first a motorized scooter, then a car, and then a chauffeur-driven car in only a matter of years. Some of the clients Adam acquired early in his career also helped him build his reputation. William and Edith Mallhood were an incredibly wealthy couple, William having owned a successful cutlery manufacturing business in Sheffield. Their home was enormous, described as a mansion that featured almost 30 rooms. Although 61-year-old William was the older of the Mawhoods by nearly 20 years, Adams first attended their home when Edith broke her leg. The Mawhoods were highly respected in the local community, and the way Adams carried himself in treating Edith raised him in the estimations of most around them, especially amongst the other wealthy citizens of Eastbourne. But even then, some of Adam's behaviors were already odd. Soon after the initial treatment of Edith, Adams would invite himself over to the home at least twice a week to check on the couple's health. Even stranger, he would occasionally do so with his mother and cousin alongside him, and often at meal times, all but forcing the polite mawheads to invite them to join them for dinner. Inviting himself and his family to dinner wasn't the worst of the presumptuous interactions the Mawhoods had with Adams either. He had the audacity to ask William for a loan of £2,000, which is over £100,000 or $141,000 in today's money, so that Adams could purchase a grand house for the purpose of turning it into his practice. Thankfully, Adams did pay this loan back eventually, 
but there were many other loans that, though smaller, did not get repaid. Perhaps the most bizarre action of all was when Adams complimented Williams's coat, asked him where he had purchased it, and then proceeded to buy himself the very same one, on the Mahoods tab. He then proceeded to do this on multiple occasions with various other items. Why didn't the Mahoods confront Adams about this behavior? Well, he was their doctor. The position of a doctor was a hugely respected one, and not one whose reputation you wanted to besmirch. It probably helped that they also had money to spare, and it wasn't as though they had rent to pay with the thousands of pounds Adams slowly leached away from them. Despite all the grace the Mahoods had extended, when William Mahood passed away and Adams discovered William had not left him anything in his will, the doctor was enraged. So enraged, in fact, that he berated mourners at Williams's funeral and even barged into the home of the recently widowed Edith once again and stole a golden pencil William had used. Edith later reported that she had not felt as though she could stop him, as he did so with the words, I will have something of his. It might seem strange that Adams expected to receive something from Williams's will, and by today's standards, it is. But in the 1920s, it was not unheard of. At this time, it wasn't unusual for some wealthy patients to leave bequests for their doctors who attended to them in their final hours. However, it wasn't required for any patient to do so, and to feel entitled to a bequest to the aggressive extent Adams did was very strange and these circumstances only became stronger when you learn that Adams would later go on to be included in the wills of around 130 people who had been his patients when they were alive. But we'll get to that. There are a lot more patients we need to talk about first, and unlike the Mahoods, Adams took advantage of more than just their social standing. You might even say the Mahoods had a lucky escape, it doesn't appear that Adams applied any shady medical practices to them or negatively impacted their physical health in any way. For some of the patients, it isn't clear exactly when they came into contact with Adams, but I'll do my best to put their accounts into chronological order. First off, Elsie Muddle. Elsie was an elderly woman who sought treatment from Adams in the mid-1920s for the typical sort of ailments that come with old age aching joints, bodily pains, sore bones, etc. He prescribed her a mixture of unspecified medicines to combat these pains, but Elsie only took a single dose of it before refusing to comply further. She complained to Adams, telling him that this stuff had actually made her feel worse, enhancing the pain rather than numbing it. According to Elsie, this refusal made Adams furious, and in response he prescribed her with a different treatment that was apparently outdated even as long ago as the 20s, a hot water treatment that involved her sitting on a pail of hot water. This, as you might imagine, was completely pointless and offered Elsie no pain relief at all. It truly seemed like Adams prescribed it out of spite when she wouldn't do as he ordered. Another patient of Adams was a Mrs. Ann Donnett, she came to Adams after being hit in the eye by a tennis ball, which resulted in a loss of vision. Adams declared that Anne was no longer able to see well enough to read documents or sign checks. Because of this, naturally, he began to make moves to see that her power of attorney was transferred over to him, so he could write the checks. If you're thinking, red flag, red flag, as this is overstepping of doctorly duties, don't worry, so was a friend of Anne's. When this friend found out what Adams was trying to do, she intervened and directed Anne to give her power of attorney to her bank manager instead, much to Adams's annoyance. Donnett narrowly escaped the clutches of the greedy, controlling man who was meant to be a caregiver. Sadly, Matilda Wooten wasn't as lucky. Matilda was a widow in her 70s, already elderly when she moved to Eastbourne and into the doctor's line of sight. Adams was incredibly attentive to Matilda, even offering her the services of his chauffeur and car from time to time. They were so familiar with each other that Matilda even grew close to Adams's mother and cousin, 
who continued to live with him. Matilda was apparently so very grateful for Adams's company and care that she gifted him with a new car, a hugely generous gift, but not one that stretched her budget enough to cause alarm, if at all. But not everybody thought Adams had Matilda's best interests at heart. Matilda was living in a hotel in what probably functioned like an assisted living situation for the 1920s. The staff became very well acquainted with her and also became accustomed to her usual mannerisms and lifestyle. As the people who interacted with Matilda most often, they became increasingly concerned about her well-being, questioning whether Adams was truly looking after her. They began to worry that he was over-medicating his patient, seeing her become lethargic and exhausted whenever Adams visited to treat her. This belief was one shared by a nurse who also attended Matilda, who thought Adams acted strangely and suspiciously in treating the elderly patient. Despite the concerns, though, nobody intervened in Matilda's care, and when she eventually passed away in 1935, everyone who knew her received a shock. At some point in her final years, Matilda had changed the contents of her will. She disinherited her stepchildren and left almost everything she was worth to her doctor, John Bodkin Adams, and it wasn't clear at all why. Matilda's stepchildren tried to contest this new will in court, but were unsuccessful, and Adams kept every penny. According to some sources, following the verdict, Adams received a number of anonymous letters threatening him not to, quote, bump off any more wealthy widows, and it is believed that these were sent by the surviving relatives of Matilda Witten. Four years after Matilda's death in 1939, another victim narrowly escaped Adams' clutches. Agnes Pike was also an elderly woman, but thankfully her relatives were close enough to be able to monitor her care, whereas Matilda's relatives could not. Agnes's family could not put their fingers on what it was about Adams that made them doubt him, but they called in another doctor to get a second opinion about Agnes's care. To their dismay, this physician couldn't find any logical reason for Adams to be prescribing Agnes such large quantities of morphine and barbiturates, morphine being an intense painkiller and barbiturates being sedatives. Adams was already angry about his medical prowess, or lack thereof, being questioned. So when Agnes was removed from his care and placed in the care of this second doctor, he became absolutely livid. Curiously enough, after only a few months in the care of a competent doctor, Agnes had almost returned to full health. The next named patient of Adams who received questionable care was yet another elderly woman, Edith Alice Morell. In 1948, Edith suffered a debilitating stroke that left her partially paralyzed and suffering from a number of related ailments such as insomnia and probable loss of various brain functions. To treat Edith, Adams used what has been described as a cocktail of heroin and morphine. That was a controversial combination, even at the time. Four nurses providing Edith with 24-hour care at the same time as Adams reported seeing the doctor administer excessive doses of medication, doses strong enough to keep the patient in a semi-comatose state. And like other patients, Edith changed her will not once, but several times throughout the years Adams attended to her. In some versions of the will, Adams was to receive a great amount of wealth following her death, while in others, he was omitted entirely. Edith passed away in either 1949 or 1950 at the age of 81. Her death was recorded as natural causes, a stroke following a short period of time in a coma. Because of this, Adams certified that there was no need for an autopsy to determine the cause of death, and Edith Morell was allowed to be cremated without further investigation. It is possible that Adams had to sign off on the cremation and took it upon himself to arrange the service, but this has been contested across various sources. It also seems to be widely contested whether or not Adams received anything from Edith's estate. Those who state that Adams did benefit from the will say that he received a significant amount of money, a chest of expensive silver cutlery, an old Rolls-Royce, 
Others say that these treasures came not from Edith's will, but were gifts from her son Claude, as a token of gratitude for providing his mother with such care. Adams himself stated on the death certificate that he had no financial interest in Edith's death, but it is not known whether he was aware of the current state of Edith's will after it had gone through so many changes. By this time, Adams had become so renowned as a wealthy, and therefore to many minds highly adept doctor, that he had among his clients a duke. Edward Cavendish, Duke of Devonshire, had been a minister in the government during the years of the Second World War. Adams attended Cavendish's bedside just two weeks after Edith Morell's death and bore witness to yet another death. Adams certified that Cavendish had died from a heart attack and therefore natural causes. But even this high-profile death was controversial. Apparently, due to the death being so sudden, Adams should have informed the coroner and therefore set an inquest into motion. But Adams neglected to do this. It is unclear whether foul play has ever been suspected in his treatment of the Duke, but it is highly suspected that Adams falsified the documentation in some way. Despite the number of respectable, regular clients he had to some extent successfully treated during his 30 years of practice in the Eastbourne area, not everyone had good experiences with Adams. Like the family of Agnes Pike, Many other patients sought second opinions after devastating consultations from Adams, only to find out that they had been scheduled for operations or procedures that other doctors considered completely unnecessary and expensive ones at that. Similarly, other doctors were skeptical of the treatments Adams was providing, even when they weren't asked for second opinions. The quantities of morphine, heroin, and barbiturates he gave to patients were significantly higher than considered normal, though this was defended as a way of being able to ease the pain of patients who were experiencing significant pain in their last days of life. Perhaps related to the quantity of drugs, many of Adams' patients were also in relatively good health before he started treating them, only to fall into comas or semi-comatose states under Adams' care before eventually passing away from unknown conditions. And a number of Adams' patients who had been gravely unwell showed remarkable improvements when they were removed from his care. Their suspicions moved them to exclude Adam from certain discussions, such as an arrangement during the war where they agreed to take on the patients of doctors who had been called up to fight. They clearly did not trust him to take on any more patients, but took it no further. As we said earlier, doctors were to be respected, not questioned. Besides, nobody had any evidence that he was committing malpractice, whether intentionally or accidentally. So, nobody challenged him. The straw that finally broke the camel's back was Adam's treatment of one of his youngest patients, Gertrude Bobby Hullett. Bobby had lived in the Eastbourne area for around 30 years when she started seeing Adams as her doctor after the death of her first husband. Bobby's husband died of a heart attack in 1950, and the grief was so intense that it made Bobby physically sick. Adams first prescribed her with sleeping pills and recommended a vacation to Switzerland, but the most effective solution he provided her was introducing Bobby to another of his clients, Jack Hullett. By 1952, Bobby and Jack were married, and Bobby was finally getting back to full health after the trauma she had endured. But, as is often the way, this peace did not last long. In 1955, Jack was diagnosed with bowel cancer, and Adams sent for a London surgeon to remove the threatening tumors. The operation was not entirely successful, requiring Jack to undergo a second operation to correct it, and putting tremendous stress on Jack's health and body. He remained badly sick and in huge amounts of pain for the next three months, ultimately succumbing to two heart attacks and passing away. Adams was, as always, attending his dying patient, but reportedly did not provide Jack with the appropriate treatments for someone suffering a heart attack. Whether or not the doctor could have prevented Jack's death is unclear, but what is clear is that Adams lied on his death certificate. 
Instead of stating that Jack's cause of death was related to the heart attacks and thus admitting that he had not acted appropriately, Adam simply, once again, noted the cause of death as a stroke. He also once again claimed he would not financially gain from Jack's will. This time, a definite lie. As you would expect, Bobby was absolutely distraught. Her grief had built exponentially over the months Jack was sick, and now she had lost not one, but two beloved partners in the space of only five years. Adams took it upon himself to dose her with barbiturates to help her cope with the mental agonies she was facing, and they had a strong effect on Bobby. Those around Bobby, friends, and attendants began to suspect Adams wasn't being completely forthcoming with the medications he was administering, believing that he was also injecting her with morphine. Her friends urged her to seek a different medical professional, but for one reason or another, Bobby stayed with Adams. One maid reportedly went to go to the police about their worries, but could not convince any other staff to back her up and failed to report it in the end. Their concerns only increased when Bobby began confiding in her friends that she was considering ending her own life. She also wrote letters expressing this in April of 1956, the month after Jack passed away. Bobby's friends could see a difference, but not a good one. They claimed her personality had changed for the worst and feared she was becoming addicted to the drugs Adams was giving her. Adams pushed on with his treatment, claiming that the very same drugs that had failed to improve Bobby's condition so far would be just the cure-all she needed. And yet, still nothing changed. That is, nothing changed until the summertime. Bobby's friends and family reported a drastic change in mood. For the first time in months, Bobby could be described as cheerful, more like her young self than the devastated woman she had been for so long. On July 17th, Bobby wrote a 1,000-pound check to Adams, allegedly to pay for a car Jack had promised to buy him before his death. Curiously, Adams asked the bank to specially clear the check so that it would arrive in his account the very next day, an odd request considering he was not short of cash. The only possible reason most can give for this is that Adams knew without a doubt that Bobby would soon die and the payment could be stopped by the executors of her will if not processed sooner. Two days later, Bobby Hullett took an overdose and fell into a coma. She was discovered comatose in the morning of July 20th and attended to by a Dr. Harris, as Adams was unavailable. Despite Bobby still being alive, Harris diagnosed her cause of death as being a stroke due to reports of her being giddy and suffering from a headache the previous day. Harris did also consider that Bobby might have taken too many of her prescribed sleeping pills, as the contraction of her pupils and shallow breathing were indicative of barbiturate poisoning and overdose, but he didn't find any pills or even the bottle to be able to confirm this. Then, when Adams eventually arrived, Harris asked him if it would have been possible for Bobby to have overdosed on the sleeping pills or barbiturates, but Adams flat out denied this. He also did not mention that Bobby was depressed and suicidal. Because of this misinformation, which Harris had no reason to doubt, they settled on the theory that Bobby had suffered a stroke. The following day, a pathologist came to take a spinal fluid sample and asked whether they should examine the stomach contents in case of barbiturate poisoning. But doctors, as discussed, said this would not be necessary. Strangely, however, later that same day, a colleague of Adams recalled him coming to ask about the appropriate treatment for barbiturate poisoning. The colleague provided the necessary information and supplied the materials to carry out this treatment. Adams did not, at any point, heed any of this advice, nor did he bring it up with Dr. Harris. Callously, as Bobby lay comatose but still breathing, Adams contacted local coroner Dr. Francis Camps with the intention to book an autopsy. When Camps discovered Bobby wasn't even dead yet, he was disgusted, accusing the doctor of extreme incompetence and refusing to make the appointment. Bobby developed pneumonia and passed away early on July 23, 1956. She was only 50 years old. In her will, she left Adams a Rolls-Royce and a thousand pounds. 
everyone close to Bobby believed that she had completed suicide and had been planning this for some time. Hey, March Madness fans, before you hit the court, let's talk foot game with Babyfoot, the true champion of foot care. While you're caught up in the madness, give your feet a winning treatment with Babyfoot's original foot peel. It's like solving a crime against roughness. Clean formula, no fouls here, just smooth, crime-free soles. Babyfoot is the top pick, number one selling foot peel in America. Score big with 20% off at babyfoot.com using code TRUECRIME20. Because whether it's March Madness or unraveling mysteries, your feet deserve a winning treatment. Babyfoot, where every step leads to victory. Babyfoot.com, use code TRUECRIME20 for 20% off. Let me tell you about a game changer in healthy eating that's perfect for both the adrenaline rush of March Madness and the gripping suspense of True Crime Podcast, Daily Harvest. Picture this, you're on the edge of your seat watching the game or listening to the latest episode and suddenly hunger strikes. That's where Daily Harvest comes in clutch. With their convenient, nutrient-packed meals, you can satisfy your cravings without missing a beat. Now, let's talk favorites. Personally, I can't get enough of their artichoke and spinach flatbread, especially when cooked to perfection in my trusty air fryer. It's the ultimate combination of flavor and convenience, perfect for those busy game nights or intense podcast marathons. And here's the best part. Daily Harvest takes the guesswork out of healthy eating, so you can focus on what really matters whether it's cheering on your team or unraveling the latest mystery. Plus, with their commitment to sustainability, you can feel good about the choices you're making for yourself and the planet. Are you ready to elevate your March Madness and true crime experience with guilt-free snacking? Head over to dailyharvest.com TCFC and use promo code TCFC to get $30 off your first box plus free shipping for a limited time only. Don't let hunger sideline your excitement. Grab your Daily Harvest and dive into the action today dailyharvest.com slash tcfc. Use promo code tcfc to get $30 off your first box plus free shipping. Dr. Camps was the same coroner who performed the postmortem on Bobby and discovered double the fatal dosage of sodium barbitol in her system. He had no doubt in his mind that Bobby's death was a suicide and questioned Adams's competency, saying it was extraordinary that the doctor, knowing the past history of the patient, did not at once suspect barbiturate poisoning. So little did he trust Adams that he reported his findings and suspicions to the police. This was the tipping point, causing the police to open an investigation into the actions of John Bodkin Adams. Investigators pulled up 310 death certificates that had been worked on by Adams, disqualifying nearly half of them before eventually settling on 23 cases to look into. 23 patients out of 132 who had died after including Adams in their wills. They began to put together a picture of a doctor who got his patients addicted to drugs, then took advantage of the resulting cognitive impairment to shoehorn himself into their wills before killing them. And with 22,000 pounds from the wills of dozens of patients going into Adam's bank account over 11 years alone, it's not hard to see why. Once word got out that the police were investigating a doctor who had been included in hundreds of wills, the press became frenzied. Adams became an international sensation for all the wrong reasons, and public opinion was firm. In Adams' trial by media, he was found guilty. This must have been difficult to hear from the locals of Eastbourne, who had known and trusted Adams for decades. He had treated their ailments, became president of the YMCA, led Sunday school classes. He even had among his clients the town's head constable. But you know what they say about judging books by their covers. John Bodkin Adams was arrested in the winter of 1956, but he would not face prosecution for the murder of Bobby Hullett who had died only five months earlier. No, instead the bizarre decision was made that they would push forward the case of Edith Morell, who had not only died six years earlier, but had also been cremated. It wasn't clear why the prosecutor chose Edith's case 
as investigators believed that any one of the other 17 suspected suspicious deaths would have produced greater evidence. The prosecutor himself acknowledged the wealth of cases to choose from, telling a reporter that he was convinced Adams had killed at least 14 of his patients through narcotic poisoning, making him a serial killer. By the time Adams went to trial on March 18, 1957, it had already been dubbed the murder trial of the century by the world's press. The police investigation had collected dozens of witness statements condemning Adams' treatment methods, largely from nurses who had worked alongside him and the families of former patients who believed their relatives had been mistreated in a way that caused comas and, ultimately, deaths. Most damning were the statements of nurses who alleged to have seen Adams administering unknown injections and otherwise behaving inappropriately in caring for his patients. That is, they probably would have been damning had it not been for an incompetent prosecutor and an intense cross-examination process from defense attorney Jeffrey Lawrence. When the nurses took the stand to give their evidence, they confidently repeated what they had told police. Adams mixed his own concoctions of drugs and administered them at will, increasing them whenever he felt like it, and they didn't feel like they could challenge him. Edith Morell and other patients were too weak or unconscious and could not stop what was happening to them. However, under cross-examination, defense attorney Lawrence produced every one of the nurses' own notebooks, which explicitly contradicted their statements. The journals recorded that the nurses themselves had prepared the majority of medications administered to Edith Morell. The contents of these injections were recorded, and Edith was conscious, responsive, and in charge of her faculties throughout the entire process. In fact, the notebooks prove that Edith had been cared for precisely as standard medical procedures dictated a terminally ill patient should be cared for. The prosecution's lead medical expert, Dr. Douthwaite, wasn't much help either, despite being Britain's leading expert on heroin and morphine use. Initially, he claimed with certainty that the doses Adams had been administering to his patients would have been 100% addictive. He further asserted that some of the doses given to Edith would have been fatal beyond doubt as soon as they were administered. He was confident beyond a doubt in his assertion that the intention was to terminate her life. However, under Cross, Douthwaite was forced to concede that there was no evidence in any case that his patients had developed addiction to the prescribed narcotics. Additionally, the defense pointed out that Edith had only been given a life expectancy of six months following her initial stroke, but had survived under Adams' care for more than two years. Duthwaite had to acknowledge that there was no possible way for Edith to have been restored to her full pre-stroke health levels, and as her condition deteriorated, the most humane course of action was to ease her pain, as Adams did with the administration of the aforementioned drugs. Finally he was forced to admit that even if Adams had reduced or entirely stopped administering the drugs given to Edith and the other victims, the resulting pain and stress on their bodies could well have killed them, and therefore the only other course must be to go on and give her more of the substances. Another detail presented by Lawrence was the proportionally tiny bequest he received upon his patient's deaths. Edith, for example, left behind an estate worth 157,000 pounds, but only bequeathed a chest of cutlery, however fancy, to Adams, worth noting that she had left behind significantly more in donations made to charity. Notably, Adams did not take the stand in his own defense, something that was absolutely unheard of at the time, and used by the press to further insist on his guilt. The trial lasted 17 days, making it the longest trial that had ever taken place in British history, and the death penalty was still on the table for a serial killer. But in the end, the prosecution had not been able to offer any substantial evidence that Adams had murdered any of the women, never mind Edith Morell. They had not been able to sufficiently link any of the patient's deaths to each other either, especially as almost everyone was in agreement that Bobby's death was by suicide. The case was also not helped by the choice of a victim whose remains had been cremated and therefore could not be examined for barbiturate poisoning. 
The judge, Lord Patrick Devlin, even directed the jury to find Adams not guilty. So complete was his frustration at the apparent incompetence of the prosecution. The jury deliberation took only 44 minutes. They acquitted John Botkin Adams of the murder of Edith Morell. And immediately following this, the prosecutor entered a nolle prosequi in the case of Bobby Hullett. This Latin term basically means that the prosecutor is voluntarily ending a criminal case before a trial can even happen. Judge Devlin called this an abusive process, since without a trial taking place for both victims, Adams could never truly be exonerated or proven not guilty in a court of law. It seems as though the prosecutor entered this purely to save face by sitting through another, inevitably humiliating trial with little to no evidence in his favor. Judge Devlin had nothing positive to say about the prosecutor, a viscount by the name of Reginald Manningham Buller. Besides the nolle prosequi, Manningham made countless other bizarre decisions throughout the course of the trial, such as selecting Edith's case as the primary focus when other stronger cases could have been pursued. One investigator even pointed out that Adams should have been charged with manslaughter, which was far more appropriate given what little evidence they did have. Manningham also failed to do his basic duties in regards to the admission of evidence in court. When the nurse's notebooks were brought to the attention of the court by the defense attorney, Manningham neither asked for a pause in proceedings to check the contents of the books, nor did he challenge their admission as evidence despite allegedly being news to him. It wasn't just Manningham's actions at the trial itself that raised suspicions, but the company he kept elsewhere. He had connections with both the government and the British Medical Association, neither of whom wanted a doctor guilty of serial killings to negatively impact the reputations of doctors as a whole, or the newly formed NHS. Though none of this was ever proven, that didn't stop people from speculating on it. However, it wasn't just Manningham that saw Adams get acquitted. The police had failed to provide sufficient evidence, and the media believed the investigation was rushed, as they feared the presumed murderer would strike again if they took too long. Following the trial, further investigation was complicated by the actions of the British Medical Association, who sent out a letter to every Eastbourne doctor, reminding them that patient confidentiality applied to the patients of other doctors, even when speaking with the police. Eventually, they managed to get Adams back into court on 13 charges, including prescription fraud, falsifying cremation forms, obstructing a police investigation, and failing to keep a dangerous drugs registry. He was found guilty of these charges, and as a result, stripped of his medical license and fined 2,200 pounds. Only four years and two appeals later in 1961, Adams's medical license was reinstated, and he went back to treating patients in Eastbourne. He successfully sued for libel against several of the newspapers who had outright proclaimed him a murderer. His mother and cousin had died long before he ever went to trial, and it seems Adams led a solitary life for the rest of his days. He never moved away from the town, where rumors continued to circulate about his career, right up until his death from complications following a broken leg in 1983. His estate was worth more than £400,000 at the time of his death, around £1.4 million or $1.7 million in today's money. After his death, the newspaper started right back up again with the same sensationalized gossip they had been printing for decades. In recent years, it's the opinion of some psychologists and true crime authors that modern understandings of what makes a serial killer would have made all the difference in finding Adams guilty. It's widely agreed that Adams was probably a sociopath, who enjoyed the control he had over his patients. He didn't necessarily want the money from their wills. He wanted to dictate to them what their wills decreed. As evidence to this theory, they point to the anger Adams displayed whenever someone didn't do as he told them to, whether that was to seek a second opinion or to decline treatment. It would also explain why he was so content to leech off of his living patients like the Mawhoods. It is also very much worth considering that 42% of death certificates completed by Adams cited a stroke as the cause of death, what historian Jane Robbins states to be a statistical impossibility. 
But again, does that actually prove murder? Did he lie to cover up assisted suicide? Was it just to deflect attention away from plain negligence and incompetence? Unfortunately, however, to this day, the evidence is not there to prove it either way. Guilty or not guilty. So, what do we think? Was John Botkin Adams an angel of mercy, easing his clients into death as painlessly as possible? Did everyone just get too caught up in the media frenzy and gossip circles, leading to false testimonies and botched investigations? Is everything we think we know just decades worth of misinformation translated through a game of media telephone? Were his actions actually mistakes, misunderstandings by the man who had blundered his way through university and graduated by the skin of his teeth? Mistakes he covered up to preserve his career, reputation, a new wealthy lifestyle. Unintended negligence. Was he a greedy, controlling murderer who drugged his vulnerable clients and manipulated them into including him in their will so he could profit when he killed them? Or was this something different altogether? Let me know what you think, because I certainly don't know. I do think one thing is for sure, though. The families of the victims deserved a hell of a lot better than the utter circus the media, prosecutor, and inept investigation provided them with. Okay, listeners, thank you for joining me in this episode as we file away another true crime case. If you like our podcast, please review us on Apple Podcast or your podcast player of choice. It's a really big help. Follow us on social media. We're active on Twitter for now at truecrime underscore cases, Facebook at facebook.com slash truecrimecases W Laney, and Instagram at truecrimecases with Laney. Our website is truecrimecasespodcast.com, and you can follow me on Instagram at Laney Hobbs BO or on TikTok at Laney Hobbs. And we'd love to hear your episode suggestions. Send us an email, tcfcpod at gmail.com. This episode was researched, written, and edited by Jesse Hawk of The Inky Paw Print, with content editing by Lainey Hobbs. Audio engineering produced by the best in the business, Neeks, at We Talk of Dreams. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or at TheInkyPawPrint.com. <laughs>